thanks. Thanks for uh, to the uh, PyCon uh, organizers for inviting AI Singapore uh, for, for today's event. Uh, so, that what Martin said. My, my name is Lawrence. Uh, I'm one of the three directors in AI Singapore, and uh, responsible actually for the the pillar that is driving industry innovation, getting AI into the industry, and so on. Uh, can I have a show of hands who who already know or understand or familiar with AI? Because I have some slides on AI. If every one of you know about AI, then I'm not going to go through that, you know? Okay. <clears throat> but, you know, um, so my background is actually I've been involved in open source nearly since the early days. Uh, the older folks around here, I don't see many. You may have heard of this company called Linux Care. Uh, we, we actually brought them in. Uh, and then subsequently, we brought Red Hat uh, into Singapore. We were the first Red Hat uh, authorized training center for APAC. So we have been involved in open source for a long time. And for those who are you know, thinking of, uh, interested in, in AI or, or high performance computing, you're thinking of building supercomputers with Linux or what we call Beowulf clusters a long time ago. Uh, I would say nearly all the Beowulf clusters uh, in the early years in the universities were all built by me and my team. Okay, so we have been involved in high performance computing for, for a very, very long time. <clears throat> so just very briefly, right, uh, what, what exactly uh, uh, is AI Singapore? So it was announced back in 2017 uh, by um, the former uh, minister of MCI, uh, Professor Yakob, uh, and uh, it was announced we had $150 million dollars. And uh, recently, we got our second tranche of funding. So it's now nearing 300 plus million. We are a national AI program uh, office. And uh, these are some of, I guess, uh, our stakeholders, right? Uh, IMDA, EDB, obviously NRF. Uh, just now, someone asked, where, where is AI Singapore? Do we have a physical office? Yes, we are physically located in NUS. But as a national AI office, we work with all the universities and ASTAR. So we actually co-fund projects uh, with them. So today we have projects with uh, NUS, uh, NTU, SUTD, SMU, ASTAR. The only other two universities that we have not been able to get projects going is actually SUSS and, and SIT. Any SUSS, SIT? No? Okay. <laughs> So in AI Singapore, we have three uh, pillars, actually four pillars now. Uh, one on AI research where uh, very traditional uh, academic funding uh, for professors to put up proposals and, and we will fund them anywhere from half a million to a million dollars. Uh, AI tech team looks at grand challenges, uh, problems that really affect Singapore as a nation and how AI uh, could be leveraged to solve some of these problems and talk more about that later. And um, I run industry innovation. Our two, I guess, the most popular programs there is the 100 Experiments and the AI Apprenticeship Program. I just met, we have, I have a student here uh, that has signed up for our AI for Industry Program, so which I can talk about that later. So I'll cover basically uh, uh, roughly this. And uh, you know, one, of the, one of the requests from the organizers, was, my slide must have Python. If not, I cannot talk. So, okay, I, I included in some Python. And then we'll talk about you know, AI and try to, basically I want you to walk out of this door um, understanding that AI is just mess, there's nothing to fear. And once you understand it, and I assume most of you have at least secondary school education, you actually, under, you actually can do AI or understand AI, okay? Very often I get asked, right, because before AI Singapore, um, I was the general manager for Revolution Analytics for the whole of APAC. Uh, Revolution Analytics is a US company that does R, okay? The world is still split between R and Python huh? uh, for data science. And uh, we were selling uh, enterprise R, and uh, we, we get asked, and even today, very often, do I use R or do I use Python? So, I did this about two, two, two days ago, I, I guess, where I pulled out Google Trends and compared the popularity of uh, programming languages. Uh, that's, you know, that's um, uh, 
uh, involved in uh, data science. So we have R, SAS, Python, SPSS, and C Sharp, just to give you know, a benchmark. Uh, for Python, you have to make sure when you do this Google Trend Analysis, you choose programming language. If not, you're going to get the snake, the actual snake in, in, your, in your data. Okay? So comparing worldwide and Singapore, actually, uh, it's very similar. Obviously, you know, Python took off just after uh, 2014. Right? Uh, it, it jumped up uh, 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 tremendously. And um, I guess the, the R guys will, will be happy to see that they are actually quite close to to C sharp in popularity now, okay, and obviously SAS and SPSS. If anyone is still using that, uh, please consider switching over to R or Python for your data analysis. Um, this is a very interesting uh, study did by Katie Nuggets um, back in 2017. So 2017 is the year that Python overtook uh, R in popularity for data science work, okay. So 2016, R was about 42% and uh, Python was about 30%. They, 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 annually, they post several hundred uh, data scientists on their uh, tools of choice. So 2017 was the first time they saw uh, Python becoming more popular. But what's really interesting is um, this slide here that shows you people who, who do Python continues, continually continue to use Python. Whereas people who use R, may migrate over to Python and actually stay in the Python world and they don't come back. But those who use Python try R and then they go back to Python. So uh, that, that tells you something, right? I mean, um, the last couple of years, uh, Python has grown tremendously in the area of uh, data science, especially with tools like Pandas, NumPy, Scikit-learn, and so on. Uh, R is coming back. Uh, today, um, you can run your TensorFlow in R with Keras, okay? Uh, the R Studio folks are putting a lot of effort to make sure whatever the big boys launch, usually the big boys launch their, their uh, AI or, or machine learning framework, typically the first language that they will have as an as a interface is Python. But the R Studio guys are working very hard to make sure R is also a first class citizen. You have to remember a lot of the, the frameworks, whether is it uh, TensorFlow or PyTorch, underlying it is often C, C++, which is often not really accessible to uh, a lot of programmers or data scientists. So Python is an easier language. And uh, just for historical, uh, uh, just for fun, right? In, in, in R, and I'm pretty sure, in, uh, I think so in Python too, um, linear regression, a package, still calls a 1970, Fortran uh, library uh, for, uh, to do, um, I think it was BLAST. So it's actually very old and very slow. So the way Revolution and today Python, how they accelerate uh, the languages out of the box is very simple. You don't use those very old 1970 Fortran uh, libraries. They just recompile it with, uh, for example, uh, Intel Max kernel library, which is optimized for current generation CPU, multi-threaded, multi-core enabled. So that gives you easily performance boost of 100 to 1,000 times without a change in code, okay? Just recompiling it. So very, very easy win. Now, for those who have done R here, okay, great. So you guys are converting, huh? Um, this, this is a very, very old slide uh, back in 20 between 2012, 2015, when I was in Revo, we used to show this. Um, it, it's R code, okay? You guys should, be able, you should, should know how to read uh, this also. It's, it's not difficult. Um, if you have used R before, can you tell me, can you process a billion rows of data on your laptop? Can, cannot? No, right? You'll crash, right, your laptop, even if it has eight or, or 16 gig of RAM, likelihood it'll crash. Um, and on Python, it's probably not, maybe it won't crash, but it's going to be very slow. So what Revolution did was to rebuild an, a dozen or so of these packages in C++ and make it more memory friendly. They, they, the word used is chunking. So they chunk the data set into memory, do the computation, take it out, put in the next chunk. So memory never gets exhausted. By doing that, 
uh, if you can see, so we did a comparison against, uh, in this case, SAS, right? Uh, we could do a billion records on a, in this case, it was a 20 core small Simlim type PCs. Huh? We, I mean, Revo was a startup, right? They practically went to Best Buy, bought five PCs off the shelf and connected it with gigabit internet. And they could run it in a cluster fashion, HPC fashion, uh, over five nodes, 20 core, 80 gig of RAM only, and they could actually be twice as fast as SAS running on a $2 million uh, high-performance system. So this is to show you the value of open source, the value of R and Python, if applied smartly and if you use the right tools. Okay? Um, today, you can get this sort of performance actually in Python. So Microsoft acquired Revolution back in 2015. And today, uh, in Microsoft, uh, if you go to machine learning server in Microsoft, they actually have a Revo, Revo Scale Pi, right? It was called Revo R, right? Now it's Revo Scale R. Now they have a Revo Scale Pi, where basically our codes are all written in C++, and now there's actually a Python wrapper around it. The benefit you get is that you can run Python in SQL database, in Hadoop, in Spark, without any change in code. You still just call your Python single line. All you need to do is basically set the context to say, I'm going to run it in SQL database. I'm going to run it on Spark. That's it. Three lines of code change. You do not need to even reprogram your whole uh, Python uh, uh, with uh, 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 Spark APIs or anything like that. You don't need to bother with uh, MPI uh, MPI, for those who are doing running on a cluster, you do not need to bother with uh, MapReduce if you want to run it on, on Hadoop, right? The code doesn't change. So take a look at that. I mean, a lot of people are not familiar with that. I, I find it's very waste. Uh, Microsoft is not doing a good job of promoting this. But if you hit bottlenecks and you say, hey, my code is running too slow, these are already available tools that can accelerate your code easily 10 to 1,000 times faster. Okay. So let, let's talk about AI, right? AI is, is here already. In fact, the, the word AI was coined back in the 1950s. And uh, today, generally, the, the term used is programs that can sense, reason, adapt, and act. But a lot of you who are beginning to be super interested in it think of AI as, oh, machine learning, deep learning. No. AI actually has a lot of non-data related technology or techniques. For example, um, rule-based systems, where AI systems are built based on spending a lot of time talking to the technician and engineers or doctors and elicit rules, know-how out of them, and then encoded in the form of if-then-else statements. Okay? Uh, or algorithm that does planning, route planning, right? And obviously, machine learning. In fact, the neural net was, the, or I think it was 1956, it was around that time that the neural net was actually uh, developed. So, in fact, some people actually found papers that was even earlier. So, it's not something that just came out in the last 10 years. Uh, so, it was a very hot topic. Uh, obviously, and sometime in the 1970s, there was what it was what the, the industry called AI winter. All of a sudden, someone published a paper to say, well, AI neural net is not going to work. Uh, it can't even do this simple problem. And all of a sudden, you know, funding for a lot of academics uh, actually stopped. And then it became popular again in the 1980s when computers became a little bit more powerful, more accessible. People could actually buy PCs and, and so on. And that's the the start of the machine learning era, right? Where you're talking about software algorithms that, that uh, get better when you throw more data at it. So that's where you get to your you know, supervised, unsupervised learning and, and so on. Your regression your, and, and uh, logistic regression or your uh, random forest. But then again, because there was very limited commercial use, uh, people became disinterested and a lot of academics unfortunately had their funding uh, cut. But good thing is a couple of researchers continue to press forward to study uh, neural networks 
And in 2010, several breakthroughs and uh, the, the way uh, deep learning came about, uh, which is basically using neural nets that's been around for a long time, but scaling it up. During my time when we studied neural nets uh, you know, 30 years ago, uh, I could only build like one or two layers of network because I only had like a few hundred rows of data sets. But today, some of these deep learning neural nets are hundreds if not thousands of layers, right? Because now you have petabytes of data that you can uh, use to train the neural net. Will we get into an AI winter? I don't think so. Uh, but I think we are really at the peak of the hype curve for deep learning. I think people are beginning to realize there is only so much you can do with deep learning. Basically, uh, uh, image recognition is very good. Recognition, uh, pattern recognition, not understanding. Uh, languages is very good. Voice to text is very good. But other than that, there's still a lot of gaps. And uh, I was just speaking to a professor yesterday. He said uh, some of his models takes weeks to train, which is not possible when you want to run a simulation and you need to bring in uh, a, a new systems based on the output of simulation. You cannot wait for weeks. So he's now developed newer techniques where he say, I'm going to put in rule-based systems into the neural nets. Okay? <clears throat> so AI in, in my personal daily life, right? Uh, well, waking, waking me up is not, not AI per se, but if I use my voice to say, you know, hey, Google, play me some music, uh, it, it will do that. Right? In, in the morning, right? Um, and when I jump to my car, um, I would typically uh, get the map turned on. No longer do I use, you know, uh, uh, do I need to press any commands on my phone. I just say, hey, Google, get me to work. So you bring up the map and show me the best route to take. <coughs> and when I get to AI Singapore's office, we have recently installed a, a facial recognition uh, system at the door. Uh, no longer do I need to flash my, my ID. Uh, I stand in front of the door and recognize, oh, welcome, Lawrence. The door unlocks. And one which you guys have been enjoying as long as you have been on email is the spam filter. Right? AI has given you back 5, 10, 15, for those who are very popular, 30 minutes of your time because you no longer need to clear your inbox. During my days when we first started email, uh, if you happen to post on some public forum, your email is publicly available. Oh, you become very popular with the Nigerians. Okay. Uh, this couple of months, I've been seeing a lot of uh, emails from Cambodia, right? Bank of Cambodia, I'm a manager. Uh, you, you, your, your name sounds like this account holder that have recently passed away. He has $32 million. Uh, can we have some transaction to you know, transfer the money to you. So you don't get to see a lot of this anymore. Why? Because uh, AI, or in this case, a lot of spam engine use a Bayesian to actually filter that out. And when I go for lunch, uh, today NUS uh, has a cashless. You can go, you still take physical notes and coins if you want to, but typically we just use uh, our phone to pay. Uh, every time you do a transaction like that, right, a, some system is at the back determining whether is this a fraudulent transaction or not, right? So it understands patterns. So they'll know like, okay, Monday to Friday, Lawrence typically eat around uh, Clementi and typically he'll spend maybe 7 or $8. But if let's say on a weekday, I, there's a transaction of 1005 in JB, that transaction is likely to be stopped, okay? Because AI is running in the background, machine learning is running in the background to determine, hey, this is an abnormal behavior. Uh, likely to be a fraud. And when I get home, uh, typically it's uh, Netflix if I have the time, and uh, they will push, right? They will push uh, movies that I like to watch or they think I like to watch, uh, TV series I like to watch uh, automatically. So the recommendation engine running behind is again machine, based on machine learning. So as you can see, these are current. But uh, even when I was a kid, I was really exposed to AI. I still remember the day that my grand grandparents bought a Sanyo Fuzzy Logic washing machine. Okay, 
So if you can look, right, today all these smart fish, right, nah, that technology has been around for the last 30 years. Okay. So AI is really not, not magic, right? It is just a bunch of maths. So let, let's look at this set of points, right? How many points do you actually need to draw a straight line? Two, right? But two, I'll say, uh, you maybe you want three or four because to give you some confidence that the model is more or less right. But in this case, maybe we have a good problem. We have a set of more than three or four points. And uh, when we say we want to build a machine learning model, what you're really trying to do is, can I draw a straight line through all these points? I'm assuming it's linear. Uh, such that um, I get this function y or f of x equals to mx plus c. And when you, so that once I have this, the value is, the, the value of doing something like this, so that when I get some future value of x prime, I can find out what is the value of f of x prime. And to do that, uh, if you are given on a piece of paper with all the points, you take the ruler and you draw that straight line, uh, what algorithm are you using? Agaration. Right, you use agaration if you are using a ruler. But mathematically, what's happening is you are trying to do, right, unknowingly, what you're trying to do is to minimize the distance between the points and the straight line, your model. So there is a, a mathematical formula to get to compute your M and your C if it's just this straight line. But it gets more complicated when you have many, many more dimensions. Great, thanks. Uh, you all still remember your uh, dy dx, right? Secondary school only, huh? dy dx. You want to find the minimum of a function, you set dy dx to zero, okay? So in this case, the loss function is, you know, yi minus xi. And you want to square it because you want to remove you know, it being on both sides of, of the line. So the neural net, uh, neural nets are basically modeled after the human brain, right? So this is a picture of a, a, a neuron, okay? And let me re redraw the, the equation you saw earlier, y equals mx plus c into nodes. So I have a node, and then uh, this is another node, and I say this, uh, a link here is, has a value of 0 0.5, and I have a bias constant factor of 2 coming in. So in this case, my y equals mx plus c is basically uh, uh, 10 times 0 0.5 plus 2, which is 7. Okay? You can see that? Now, what if I add another node? Okay? With some other values, and I add more. Now, let's say I want to constrain the output to a value of, you know, so that it doesn't explode. I can use a function like, in this case, a, a tange or a, 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 there's a couple of tange and, and I think uh, logistic regression, you can use that, right? You can use log. So I can apply some form of function at the, at the other end. So basically what you have is actually a very simple <laughs> neural network that takes in a set of inputs where there it's multiplied against a set of weights and then applied some transformation function and get output. This is what people have been trying to you know, simulate uh, when they design neural nets. So let's look at a little bit more complicated neural network that tries to predict whether is there rain or no rain. Right? And basically, in this case, you probably will take things like you know, air pressure, uh, wind condition, and so on and so forth. And maybe even historical uh, data, whether it rained or no rain on that particular day, the last 10 years. And what you want to do is with all this set of data, which is now presented in the form of a vector, maybe I should just go back, right? So all this, I can rewrite it in the form of a ve uh, vector, right? So vector and matrices are super important. Um, in, 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 in this view. So I can now put the numbers in, in, in a vector, and what I do is I present this into a neural net, and initially maybe the, the neural net, the weights, is all randomized, okay? I compute, I do all the matrix multiplication throughout, I get an output to say whether is it rain or no rain, I get some value. But I also know the actual value because I have last 10 years of data. So I compute the error. 
and then I backpropagate this error. Now, you can do it very simply where if it's too high, reduce by 10%. All the weights just minus, just times 0 0.9. If it's too, too, uh, too low, every all the weight times 1.1. You could do that. But that's not a very smart way to do things, okay? So we do it using gradients and step size to try to... Uh, because once you know the, the error function, the curve, you can use gradients to basically step faster to get to convergence. So basically what you want to do is to minimize the error function. And what you want to do is to find a set of weights globally such that when I present more and more features, more and more rows to the net, I can get to a, to a point where when I present new data sets, it can correctly predict whether is it rain or no rain. So you keep doing this hundreds, if not thousands of times, right, or millions of times. Because unlike y equals mx plus c, where you, there's a metabolic formula for you to compute, in this case, there's no, none. It's a lot of trial and error in that sense, okay? So you have to keep changing uh, the, the weights until you get uh, uh, to convergence. And once you get to convergence, what you basically mean is that you get your y equals mx plus c. In this case, it's a y equals to m1, x1 plus m, so on and so forth. Many M's and many C's, let's say, right? Uh, it's a black box. But you basically get a function, a model, a f of x, that given a new input will be able to tell you what is the output. So now that I have that, I can now show it a new, new uh, data point and it can tell me rain or no rain. So that's basically what a neural net does. Matrix, multiplication, dy dx equals to zero, right? As long as you can figure out what is your y, what is your, your error function. So how does this apply to uh, computer vision? When, we first start, when I first started uh, studying neural nets, we were already trying to recognize numbers, right? And this was 30 years ago. But we did something very stupid. All images are still pixels. It was on a two by two uh, matrix. And what we did then was we opened up the matrix into a vector. So first, first row of the square of the matrix became the first part of the vector. Then the second row became the second part of the vector and so on and so forth. So we basically just lengthen out. But when we do that, what happens? You lost spatial information. The fact that this, the fact that let's say this dot here is actually next to this guy has been lost because now it's been put into a different part of the uh, vector, okay? Then some, a guy came up with a very brilliant idea. Basically he said, well, let's, let's not do it that way. Because why we did it that way was I need to feed it into a neural net. Neural net is expecting a vector. And this guy said, okay, no, no. Let's do a bounding box. Two by two, three by three, four by four, five by five, whatever you, you decide. And I just slide it across the image and do all sorts of mathematics uh, manipulation around it, okay? To extract out from this picture of number eight, a vector that is representative of this image. So they do things like convolution, uh, max pooling, which is just average, right? The math is actually not that difficult if you take a look at it. It's really just averaging, a lot of averaging. And at the end of this extraction layer, uh, you basically get a set of uh, extracted features, which is nothing more than a vector. And once you get a vector, you just put it into, you just train a standard two, three, four layer neural net. You can do that. Okay, so image converted to a vector. Vector, I just train it with a, a standard neural net. And that's exactly how facial recognition works. So when, when AI Singapore installed the camera, uh, what they did was uh, they asked us to submit our uh, picture. They took a picture of us. And uh, since this was uh, E2, they have already trained a neural net based on probably a few million faces from China, right? So every time a face is presented to a neural net, it can generate a vector, a unique, a unique vector of that face. So they put my picture there, I get a unique vector. Think of it like, like our NRIC, except that instead of seven digits, it's, it's you know, 128. 
Uh, so this vector is now stored in the database. So when I next day, when I come in, when I stand in front, it, that same network is, is used. The face is presented to the network. It generates a vector. Now, does the vector needs to match exactly what is stored in the, in the database? It's not going to match because I went for a haircut or I went for a slimming session over a weekend. My face looks slimmer now. Or I went to Sentosa for sun, you know, sun tan. I look darker. It's going to look different. But mathematically, we can do a cosine similarity between two vectors. Now, maybe the, van, the, the NUS will say, well, as long as this vector, uh, if, if I get 80% match, it's good enough. This is a person that we, we recognize. OK, so very straightforward. So again, just changing it to a vector. Languages is a little bit harder. Um, I'm sure some of us Singaporeans will speak like this, where you know, you're going to end up with Tamil, Mandarin, Cantonese, English, Malay, English, Malay, in a single sentence. Right? It's, it's hard for uh, a lot of the American-based Google, Microsoft, Facebook, uh, 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 NLP stuff to work. Okay, there's no, no sound coming out. Yeah, it's okay. So, so uh, what happens is, in the one of the projects is speech to text. So we have a professor that has done Singlish, so we can actually do now Singlish, okay? Um, and how do you convert speech to what? To vector. Again, a vector. Very simple. When I say the word hello, this is the waveform that is, jet, is collected by the system. I just slice it let's say 20 milliseconds, and then I have a vector already, okay? So it's about converting, in this case, wave, audio wave, uh, into a vector, and once it's in a vector, I can again train it with a neural net, okay? And uh, once it's been trained, whatever it's, it's, it's hearing, it will generate some words that it thinks that's what it is. It, we have to do some pre-processing, and then it will check against a known database and bring out the most likely. Uh, word that he has heard. Right? That's how speech to text work. Uh, what's really interesting is this NLP, and I'm sure a lot of us are interested in NLP, right? So let's say I have this word, I love to eat Ocean Park Chak Kway Tiao. And uh, I only have a vocab of 10 words. And my vocab is me, you, I, to eat, love, chicken, rice, bihun, kway tiao, and laksa. So how do I convert this sentence into a vector? Very simple. Uh, does I, uh, 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 does me appear in, in the words, uh, in the sentence above? Don't have, zero. Does you appear? Don't have, zero. Does I appear in the sentence? Yes, it's a one. Uh, two, does it appear? Yes, it's a one. Eat, does it appear? Yes, it's a one. So this, uh, there are many ways to do it, but this is one easy way to do it. But obviously, we humans don't have a 10-word vocab, right? Unless you are good from Marvel, you only have a one-word vocab. But we typically use 20,000, 30,000 uh, vocabulary or dictionary. So think of a 20,000 vector, a 20,000 long vector to do this. And unfortunately, uh, most sentences are like 20, 30 words long. So you're going to have a vector that has 20, 30 uh, of that indices as one. The rest are all zeros. Okay? So whatever it is, you can still convert it to a vector. And once you can convert it to a vector, you, know, you can train uh, uh, the neural nets to understand sentiment analysis and so on and so forth. You just need to label it. So the difficult part is labeling the data sets. And if, let's say, you want to really go about labeling uh, Singlish, you have to pull out uh, a, a corpus of data, maybe from Hardware Zone or wherever your favorite forum, uh, get students or pay someone to read each sentence and label it positive, negative, positive, negative uh, sentiments. Uh, do whatever pre-processing is required, you train it, and um, if once the model has been trained, present new data, you will generate your sentiments. So let, let's move on, right? Um, AI and jobs, 
so why, so why, okay, so this was Milton uh, Fredman. He visited a, one of the Southeast Asian countries a couple of years back, and he saw workers digging with shovels to, to build a canal. And he asked the foreman, why, why shovels? There's already tractors to dig. And the foreman said, well, if you don't understand, uh, uh, Mr. Fredman, this is a job creation pro program. So he said, well, if it's job creation, give the workers spoons, don't give them shovels, right? You need a lot more workers. What I'm trying to say is that, you know, AI is here. Uh, let, let's make use of it to increase our productivity. And uh, a lot of people, I feel they, they, they use the word wrongly, that AI will replace jobs. No, AI will replace tasks. Unfortunately, there are some jobs that are single tasks that, yes, when that task is replaced, you lose your job. But most of us has multiple tasks in a day, right? Our job in, in requires us to do multiple tasks. So as a task goes away, you, you get another task assigned to you and so on and so forth. Programmers will be replaced by AI. How many programmers here? All, I guess. No, no. Programmers will be replaced by programmers who use AI. Okay? Replace programmers with lawyers, doctors, account engineers, whatever. If you don't use you AI or machine learning to help increase your productivity, uh, you'll be replaced by someone who is using it. As simple as that. So what are we doing in AI Singapore? We already spoke about AI research technology, uh, innovation maker space. Uh, due to lack of time, I will just skip this uh, and focus on, on what could be very interesting to some of you. Uh, in the 100 experiments, the projects that we have done, we have, already, uh, we have 300 in our pipeline, right? 300 over companies interested. We have already approved 40. We have already executed 30. The other 10 is in you know, usual legal discussion, uh, negotiation. And of the 30, we have already completed 10 in nine months. And it cuts across all these sectors. The way the 100 experiment works is this. You, your company comes to us with a problem statement that is AI related. You have data sets and you have said, I've done my due diligence. I've tried to look at vendors and so on. No one can solve my problem. Can AI Singapore help? Can a professor help? Because it's really a cutting edge. So if we think it is, we will then bring in a professor or our own uh, AI Singapore engineering team to take a look at it, work with you, and I will put up anywhere from $180,000 to $250,000. Money doesn't go to you. You have to put in one-to-one -one matching, $180,000 or $250,000. 30% cash, 70% in kind. Okay? The reason is very simple. Even I give you the money today, you can't find and hire machine learning uh, professors or, 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 doctor, or scientists or engineers. It's very hard. But we have this in our ecosystem. So rather than give you the money, we try to do the, the, the MVP for you. And along the nine months or 18 months, you get to learn. And then hopefully you have the skill sets. And in the team that we assemble, which includes both our project managers, our developers, our AI engineers, we also have what we call AI apprentices, which you can hire at the end of... Uh, the project. So this is how uh, 100 experiments and AI, AI apprenticeship works. And you will tell me, Lawrence, are you sure we cannot find Singaporean AI talent? I will tell you it's a myth. These are all Singaporeans. Two batches have graduated. We are now in batch three. Batch three will graduate in December. Batch four just started a month ago. Every, every application when we open for apprenticeship, we have 150 to 160 who apply. We only take in uh, 20 or so. Okay? And it's by competitive. Uh, if you don't know Python, forget it. Uh. We won't even consider you. You'll be... You need to come in very simple. Singaporean, you pass our technical test. I don't care whether you're a computer scientist, you are an uh, engineer, you are finance, BZ. I don't care. It doesn't matter. That's what you did in your previous life. But if you have been studying Python or R or machine learning AI on your own the last few years and have some skill sets, but you have not had an opportunity to work on a real AI problem, we want you. You come in, we give you to that 100 experiments, that half a million dollars project to work on. Every 100 E will have two apprentices together with uh, uh, our uh, AI mentor. And it's to deliver, huh? it's to deliver a working system at the end of nine months. Right? The sprint cycles is two, two weeks to three weeks. 
We have companies that came to us to say that our sprint cycle is one day. I said, uh, no, 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 no. Uh, our practice may not be able to take it in one day. Okay. And the AIAP, uh, this was just announced uh, two days ago. Uh, IDC gave us, uh, awarded us uh, uh, 2019 Talent Accelerator for Singapore, right? So this was just awarded to us for our AIAP uh, program. So what are the pro talent programs we have? Uh, the apprenticeship. Uh, we have AI for Industry, uh, which is a 12-month MOOC style. We partner with DataCam. Basically, you apply, you, you do some pre-coursework to, to make sure that programming is really what you want to do. Because I don't want to get you in, you pay, then tell me, Lawrence, I don't want a programming I don't like. I, I, I want a refund. It's too messy. So make sure, we, make sure that this is really what you want. You pay, you come in, you do, and uh, it's basically based on data cam. Uh, we also have an AI for everyone. It's three hours. We run uh, twice, um, twice a month, right? We, we have, people have asked us, why don't you just videotape and put it online? I feel that having that you know, human interaction is super important. So uh, we run it twice a month, every Friday, every Saturday. So if you're interested, just come, uh, register and, 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 and try to come. Uh, it's open, because it's so popular, we only open it uh, one, one month ahead, okay? Uh, we didn't stop at that. We had AI for Students that was announced back in November 2018, and we actually have about 11,000 kids on this same data camp platform. Okay, so the teacher will come to us and say, okay, uh, I want to register my students. I want to run these 10 modules on data camp. We offer it free to them. We have a partnership with data camp. So if you are an educator here, uh, please come and look at data, what data camp has and uh, select the modules that you want. Write into us, we'll just open up the access for you free. Right? Data camp annual subscription is 300 US per person. Yeah. We're offering it free to uh, our students. Uh, we didn't stop at that. We went down all the way to the kids. So I got NUS high students to come in last December. They took our AI for everyone, dumbed it down, added a little, a little bit more fun uh, for the primary four, five, and six. So for those of you who are keen, who are Singaporeans who are keen to uh, volunteer your time to, to teach uh, kids, please, we are looking for facilitators. It's very hard. I mean, there's probably what, 70, 80 of you here. Uh, I, I talk, you all sit down and listen. Imagine 70, 80 kids, you, no way you can talk and they listen, right? You need one facilitator to four to five kids. Uh, our AI for Everyone, we did a special edition for International Women's Day. We have about 600 who turned up. Uh, this was at the ITE Central uh, College. All women, panel, speakers, MC, all women, no men in the room. I was the two fortunate men in the room for the first five minutes. After opening, we went downstairs to drink coffee. Everything, the whole session was done by women, including the presenters from 100 experiments. Some of them were women uh, CTOs and so on. So what's next? We have our usual uh, uh, website, Facebook, LinkedIn. Please sign up and follow us and so on. Uh, you guys are fortunate. Uh, this is a pre-announcement. Uh, we are going to launch our makerspace. In fact, uh, DPM Hing will actually formally announce it on 13th of November. Uh, but the site is up and running and we are testing stuff and so on. The whole goal of Makerspace is to learn AI, do AI, share AI. So under learn, we have all the courses that we can offer, we put it there. Some are free, uh, the, those with data care unfortunately is paid. Uh, do, we'll have software, whether is it done by AI Singapore or uh, curated by us that is you know, from uh, academic universities overseas, we'll put it there. Share AI really is a place for uh, the work that we are doing for our engineers, for our apprentices to actually share. So if you're interested, just go to makerspace.aisingapore.org. It's already up and running. What is next? Uh, a lot of people apply to get into our AI apprenticeship program, but when I look at their CV, some have zero Python programming skills, right? So we have to tell them, this is not a reskilling program. It's a deep scaling program. You come in here to deep skill. So I've put up a 12 months learning journey for those who are really interested. Uh, all the materials there are free. All right, I put the links there. The only one that actually you have to pay if you really want to is the Spark Big Data Platform from Databricks. It's like $75 to get that cert if you want um, to go to the course, but if you don't want, you can skip that. 
Other than that, everything there is free. Okay? So, um, and if you notice, right, why, why, why software engineering right in the beginning when we're talking about machine learning? Because I'm looking at AI engineers. I'm not looking at data scientists. I want AI engineers. In fact, moving forward, that's where the industry is looking for. Not more PhDs to create new algorithms. There's more than enough algorithms. But you want engineers who can actually deploy those algorithms. And to deploy it means you need to understand Docker, containers. You need to understand the cloud. You need to understand how to do unit tests and so on and so forth. You need to understand Scrum. You need to understand Agile. Unfortunately, a lot of people who jump into machine learning has zero knowledge of that. They just know how to use R or use Python to code. It's not good enough. So uh, in our AI apprenticeship, in fact, uh, the first two months, they actually do a lot of software engineering, okay? uh, including with the machine learning stuff. Another announcement. So we announced our AIP win. Uh, AI for Students version 2. Remember version 1, I said you need a teacher to come and say, these are the, the, the modules I want. Please uh, sign, sign me and my students up. Version 2, we want to accelerate that. We feel it's very slow. So we open up to any students now. No need teacher. We are the teacher. We already curated a set of courses. So any student that is in Singapore public school can sign up. So if your son, daughters, niece, nephew, please just register with the on our makerspace with their school account. We need their school, their school uh, email. And uh, we'll open up a batch every month. Okay, so today is the opening. Today is the first day of registration. Right, we purposely time it for uh, PyCon. So it's really for students. Huh? Uh, unfortunately, if you are from United World College, uh, sorry, uh, that one I, I cannot support. Right? So it must be an MOE school. So free. You are going to get access to the whole data camp platform, which is worth 300 US. And, and a lot of additional materials actually is all here. So from the data camp platform all the way to you know, learning how to set up an environment to do machine learning, to uh, supervise unsupervised learning, and so on. Right? So our team have put this together. So just to close up, uh, this is uh, Prof Chen Suan. He was interviewed uh, in, a, in a BBC panel a while back. And he made a statement that I felt was, was super important to, to emphasize. Right? A lot of people think that AI is here. You're going to have terminators to terminate us. Human race will wipe out. But no. Now that you understand why it's AI, right? It's nothing more than Y equals MX plus C, DY, DX, gradient set to zero. Very simple. You can't do a lot of these things. But for those tasks that it can automate for us, it will give us back time so that you can go home at 5 o'clock and spend time with your kids and be more human. You don't need to be stuck on a computer from 9 to 9. Okay, so we believe, I believe very strongly, AI will allow us to be more human. Thank you.